You have not recorded it yet? Broadcast. Oh, broadcast. All right, Marvin. Scripture reading. Okay. Please open your Bible to Mark chapter 11, verse 25. Okay. Mark chapter 11, verse 25 says, And whenever you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against anyone, so that your Father also who is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. Okay. As we can see from this morning's lesson, uh, we have a responsibility to forgive. And there's a vertical relationship between us and God, meaning up and down, that defines how we deal with other people horizontally on the same level. This morning, I want to specifically discuss the forgiveness of sins. Now, we recognize from scriptures that forgiveness is a great blessing from God. When God forgives our sins, our offenses, he removes the penalty and casts the sin itself far from us, as far as the east as from the west. And he bestows a favor on us. God gives us mercy rather than judgment. We can also notice that our forgiveness from God is conditional. Before God forgives a man or a woman their sin, that person must repent or turn from that sin. To forgive is to be forgiven. The second clear condition that comes from God, the forgiveness that we are supposed to have, is uh, our forgiveness, how we express ourselves to our brothers and sisters, those in the church. Go to Matthew chapter 6 and verse 12. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 12. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 12 is part of the model prayer. And it tells us, and forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. From Matthew, go to the right, go to the book of Luke. Luke chapter 6, verse 37. Luke chapter 6, verse 37. Luke chapter 6, verse 37. Judge not, and you will not be judged. Condemn not, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. And from Luke chapter 6, go to Mark chapter 11. Go back to the left, Mark chapter 11, verse 25. Go back to the left. 
And whenever you stand praying, forgive. If you have anything against anyone, so that your Father who is in heaven may forgive your trespasses. What we can see from Matthew chapter 6, Luke chapter 6, Mark chapter 11, is the requirement is that we forgive other people as God has forgiven us. Go to Colossians chapter 3 and verse 12. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 12. Colossians chapter 3, verse 12. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. Understanding the scope of our responsibility to forgive. We noticed this morning that sin is ultimately against God, is a violation of God's law. And it is God who forgives or remits our sin. So then how can I forgive my fellow man? How is my forgiveness to be like God's forgiveness? Forgiveness comes from a proper attitude and a desire to be like Christ. As we know, Jesus had a response and was reviled. He did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten but he committed himself to him who judges righteously. Those who seek to promote themselves, those who seek to protect their rights, those who seek to come out on top are going to have difficulty with forgiving other people. Go to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 31. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 31. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 31. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Church, read this with me. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. Now, when we see bitterness, what does it mean? It means holding a grudge. The Greek word here is pikros, and it means acidity, especially a poison, literally or figuratively, bitterness, we're supposed to put that away. Wrath is a passionate anger that results in verbal abuse or violence. And the Greek word here is thymos, and it means anger, wrath, rage, and it refers generally to anger or wrath, both human and divine. When we see the word anger in this passage, it is a violent passion. And the Greek word here is orge, and it means wrath, anger. And this specifically refers to human anger or divine wrath. Clamor, when we see clamor, it refers to loud arguments, 
and quarrels. The Greek word is kraj, and it means exactly that. Evil speaking is slander. It is speech injurious to another's good name or defamation of their character. It is abusive speech. Malice is an evil disposition of mind and a desire to hurt someone. These actions and these attitudes work against forgiveness and reconciliation. If you desire to forgive another, you have to reign over these sins. You have to agape, put the in love, put the interest of somebody else above you. A forgiving person is approachable, leaving the door open for reconciliation. Our forgiveness flows from a desire for reconciliation. Matthew chapter 18, verse 15. Matthew chapter 18, verse 15. Matthew chapter 18, verse 15. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. Now, we text without context is a pretext for a proof text. Jesus has just finished telling the parable of the lost sheep, expressing God's heart towards the lost. He leaves the 99 to save one and then says, moreover, if your brother sins against you, go to him. The forgiving person is not merely passive waiting for the offender to repent. He actively seeks that repentance or that reconciliation with the one who has wronged him. Forgiveness is not limited by the extent of the sin or the frequency of the offense. After Jesus taught the disciples what to do to restore an offending brother, in Matthew chapter 18, Peter asked a question. Matthew chapter 18, verse 21. Matthew 18, 21. Then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgiven, forgive him? As many as seven times. And one thing we want to pay attention to here is that seven times was considered a large number under the Levitical or Mosaic law. You were only required to forgive three times. So Peter, when he's asking this question, says, God, I'm going to forgive seven times. How much better am I? Peter thought he was being generous. But Jesus replied in Matthew chapter 18, verse 22. Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 70 times seven. So are we to keep count and refuse to forgive on the 491st offense? No, Jesus is expressing the limitlessness, limitlessness of our forgiveness. Our forgiveness must be unlimited. If our brother repents, I must forgive because his sin cannot exert, exhaust my mercy, just like. God's mercy cannot be exhausted 
by my sin. Jesus continues and he tells a parable about a man who owned a huge unpayable debt. When we see the word 10,000 talents, we don't really understand what that is. And according to some biblical scholars, that could be as much as $16 million. And his master had forgiven the debt. He had a creditor who owed him. He had someone who owed him a manageable debt. 100 denarii translates to about 100 days wages. Yet he would not even allow him a grace period, throwing him in to prison. And then Jesus makes an application in chapter Matthew, chapter 18, verse 32. Then his master summoned him and said to him, you wicked servant. I forgave you all that debt. I forgave you, parenthetically added by Ernest, $16 million because you pleaded with me. And should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. So also my heavenly father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. Forgiveness demands a commitment to release the offender. You notice that Jesus Christ put a further condition in verse 35. He said, you must forgive from the heart. There is a difference between lip forgiveness and heart forgiveness. True forgiveness demands a commitment to release the offender from every way that I can. Be careful every way that I can. I cannot release an offender from the moral guilt of his sin. And he may be in violation of a civil law. However, my forgiveness must be more than just sentimental talk. It must be more than just a hypocritical appeasing, if you will. Jeremiah describes God as one who would forgive sins and remember them no more. Jeremiah 31, 34. Jeremiah 31, 34. Jeremiah 31, 34. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother saying, know the Lord. For they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. That's an example we must follow. We must forget about the offense and commit to not hold it against the person after they've repented. The person who forgives another person will not say, does this mean I must shake their hand? That I must go out the same door? That I must speak to them? Just as God's forgiveness of our sins heals the breach, the severance in the relationship, so must our forgiveness. Does God demand that I forgive unconditionally? 
there is a popular sentiment and an image of Christianity that has done much harm to the Christ, cause of Christ. Many people think Christians are the ones who forgive those who sin against them, even if they do not repent, and even before they acknowledge their sin unconditionally. Now, I'm going to ask you this morning, is that what God demands? I can affirm it is not only what Christ demands, but this concept is and practice is harmful to God's purposes. We must understand that God's forgiveness is conditional upon repentance. Go to 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. First John chapter one, verse nine. If we church read this with me, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Notice there's a conditional statement here in 1 John 1, 9. If we confess, he is faithful and just. However, if we change this and we say, if we do not confess, he is not faithful. If we do not confess, we do not receive the cleansing from unrighteousness. Go to Psalm 51, verse 2. Psalm 51, verse 2. Psalm 51, verse 2. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Even so, to follow the example of God, our forgiveness, is conditional. Jesus Christ states in Luke chapter 17, verse 2, go there, Luke 17, verse 2. Luke chapter 17, verse 2, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were cast into the sea, then he should cause one of these little ones to sin. Pay attention to yourselves. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. The meaning here is clear. The Greek word for if is in, and it introduces a condition, the condition for a rebuke and for granting of forgiveness. If eon, a person sins, we must, that's an imperative, rebuke him. And if he repents, we must, imperative, forgive. This is as clear as you're going to find on the top. Forgiveness is conditional upon repentance. And this is one of the same criteria that God uses before he forgives sins. 
This does not lessen the graciousness or the mercy of us or of God. It reflects the true intention and the desire for forgiveness, a new relationship. How can a new relationship be established with one who refuses to repent? Jesus said in Matthew chapter 18 that if he refuses to repent, he should be treated as a publican and a sinner. What that means is an outsider. Finally, I want to make the case that it is harmful to a person to forgive them without requiring repentance. Sin requires a rebuke, a correction, if you will. Ignoring sin teaches sinners that sinning has no consequence. This violates the concept of holiness. This violates the concept of fellowship when one can have the benefits of the relationship while living in unholiness. So you might ask, if I forgive, then I must forget. Yes. Never bring up the sin again. If that one is done before the person repents, how then will I bring him back to God? Conditional forgiveness does not diminish the mercy or God's mercy, my mercy or God's mercy. The idea that Christians cannot ever hate, the idea that Christians cannot ever be angry, the idea that Christians cannot lack forgiveness is unbiblical. God himself is eternally angry with sin, but his anger, his hatred, and his unwillingness to forgive are tied to his holiness or his truth. He loves, God hates, and is angry in appropriate ways. Our task as believers is to imitate this. We are to be angry with and hate sin properly. We are to love what is good properly. I absolutely believe it's important for us to understand that forgiveness is not just unilateral, meaning one way internal effort to get our emotions under control. By that, what I mean is we must always be open to God's grace. We must always be eager to extend forgiveness. But I must not be the obstacle to forgiveness. I must not be the obstacle to reconciliation. By God's grace and God's power, we must overcome anger and resentment. We must release our bitterness to God. We must commit our adversaries to him and always be ready and always be willing to forgive. We must always be ready and hopeful to reconcile those relationships. However, when the offender does not request forgiveness, we can immediately say forgiven. There's no consideration because we have been ready and eager to grant them forgiveness. However, this on the subject of the extent of our responsibility, we have to understand that not every 
offense requires that they repent. Way too often as people, we are too thin-skinned and self-focused. By the way, somebody say with me, Balat Sabuyas. We are not to be that way. We are not to be easily offended when someone says something or fails to say something. We misread over or we overread people's intentions. We do not give people the benefit of the doubt. We immediately require that they repent or apologize. You hurt my feelings. In reality, many offenses are unintentional. And instead of becoming offended and requiring repentance, we should allow our love for them to cover many offenses. Go to 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 7. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 7. First Peter chapter 4, verse 7. The end of all things is at hand. Be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of of your prayers. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another. As good stewards, of God's varied grace. From 1 Peter, go to Proverbs chapter 19, Proverbs chapter 19, verse 11. Proverbs chapter 19, verse 11. Good sense makes one slow to anger. And it is his glory to overlook an offense. It requires a wise heart to know when to rebuke and when to overlook. When to rebuke and when to overlook. God has extended grace to us. And if we repent, we will be forgiven. We have to, salvation is free. It is not earned. It came to us from Jesus Christ. He prayed the price. We have to do our part. We have to hear the word of God. Romans chapter 10, verse 17 says, so faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. Luke chapter 13, verse three, we must repent. No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. We must confess our sins. Romans chapter 10, verse 9, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Romans 10, 10, for with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. We must be baptized. 1 Peter 3, 21 Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as the removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Okay, cool. We're baptized, once baptized, always saved, right? Wrong. We must remain faithful. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12. 
Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. Verse 13, no temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with the temptation, he will provide a way of escape that you may be able to endure it. If you are a member of this congregation or not a member of this congregation, and you are in need of prayers for the problems that life gives us, please let us know and we will say that public prayer. If you are a member of this congregation or not a member of this congregation, and you have fallen back in love with the ways of the world and need to be restored to the Ecclesia, the Church of Christ, then please let us know and we will say that public repentance prayer for you. And if you have never put on Jesus Christ through the act of baptism for the remission of your sins, I'm going to ask that you respond, come to the front. All preparations have been made and we will be glad to take care of it today.